here. And then, Elaine, well, I do have some questions prepared um, to be able to ensure that the conversation moves forward. But I think probably the best first thing to happen would be if you could introduce yourself. Sure. Hi. Hi, everyone. Well, I, ju I just want to get a sense of who's in the room. Like, how many of you are uh, have a design degree versus, you know, you're just trying to switch into to UX? Like, can you type in the, in the chat so I have a, have a sense? Just switching in, or you have a design background? Landscape architecture. Okay, great. Quinton? Anybody else? UX bootcamp graduate, UX bootcamp grad. So all of you graduated from the from the General Assembly bootcamp. That's all right. Okay. I see. I see. Great. Okay. Um, but the reason why I'm asking is depending on what your background is, there's different ways to get into UX. <laughs> sure and and just to call that out you know here what you'll find is it is our ux bootcamp graduates and recent alumni as well oh recent alumni as well okay yeah. okay okay let's see so so i i guess it's mostly um yeah most mostly people graduated from the bootcamp but are you from like engineering or marketing or you know, graphic design or, okay, some are UX design and you still go to, okay, graphic design, great. Okay, cool. Um, uh, uh, George, I, I could share a few slides if that's good. Please. Okay. So, yeah, that'll be easier to explain. Oh, sales. Okay, marketing, awesome. All right. Okay, so my name is Elaine. And uh, okay, this is me here. <laughs> yeah, I'll just make it easier to, to talk through this. Yeah, so my name is Elaine and uh, I've been in the UX industry for 20 years actually. Um, so, oops, let me see here. Okay, so here's my background in one slide. Um, so I grew up in Hong Kong and I went to university at Carnegie Mellon, which is a very tech oriented school like MIT. So even though I was actually studying visual communications in undergrad, but by the time I graduated, like the fourth year, most of our projects were um, like tech, like uh, like U UI related. Like back then when <laughs> Macintosh was still black and white, I think many of you probably haven't seen that. <laughs> um, yeah, so we were designing um, like ATM machine interactions and also uh, computer like print dialogue boxes back even back then this is two this was 1994 95 i think yes so when i when i graduated i actually went to work in new york at henry dreyfus which was actually the first industrial design firm okay if any of you have 3d backgrounds or even landscape architecture okay back then it was the first dot com boom okay so back then even in an industrial design firm the highly paid jobs were actually web development. Yeah, so I was actually working on the, in an industrial design firm, but on the web web and internet side of things. So uh, back then, even like a ad banner, <laughs> I don't know if you can still remember those ad banners was like a million dollars. Yeah, it was crazy back then. It was just a JPEG, right? Um, and then I went, went on to work at Razorfish as one of the first internet companies. Um, that the digital transformation. So we helped companies like Charles Schwab uh, move from bricks and mortars to online. Um, so that was like the first generation. Um, and then during my master's internship, I actually went to work first, went back for my master's at Carnegie Mellon because there wasn't many programs even in interaction design back then. This is 1998. I went back to do my master's and then I worked at Philips Design for my master's internship. And there I worked on smart home projects. <laughs> and this was 1998, okay? Now it's becoming a reality, but this is like 20 years later. Um, and after I graduated from Carnegie Mellon, I went, moved to the West Coast and I worked at uh, Fitch, um, which is one of the, um, if you are old enough to remember what our iOmega zip drives <laughs> when there were still floppies, <laughs> yeah. And actually they did, uh, they kind of, kind of the founders, some of the founders of Fitch uh, came up with all the methodologies for UX research 
Yeah, it's like so, so the ethnography part of UX research. So um, I've learned from some of the very original people. Yeah. Um, and then after that, uh, so I, I worked there for like 2000 to 2002, and then it was the dot com bust. <laughs> dot com bust, I went back to Asia, and that's been 18 years already. Yeah. And just last year, I came over to Vancouver just to see my parents, and then COVID exploded. And I decided to stay here and I opened another company in Canada. Yeah, so now I have two companies. One is in Hong Kong and that company is focused on helping Western companies in Asia market. So we do a lot of strategy and research, user research over there in Asia uh, where I, I, ha I have teams who speak Chinese, right? I'm Mandarin and Cantonese, right? Over here in Canada, I have another company which is the same name, um, but it's focused uh, focus on helping tech startups because I also noticed that right now in the UX industry, there are many people who are trying to get into the industry like yourselves. Okay. But um, you would see that in the market, there are many employers who are looking for senior roles. And we've, because I also run IXDA Hong Kong uh, previously. Uh, it's a UX community in Hong Kong. I see it's like a global community and we have local chapters, right? So I used to run that for 15 years. Now uh, we just started the IXDA Vancouver chapter. Um, actually we resurrected it because it was dormant for three years. Yeah. Um, so so I, I, I know what's going on in the industry because a lot of the people who are volunteers come in and tell us like they're looking for jobs or they're looking for talent and we, we see where the gap is. Uh, there are many people trying to get into the industry and they find it really hard, not because of their skills, but they don't know how to get in. Like they keep like bumping, <laughs> bumping on the wall because they, they think UX is just one big blob of skills. Okay, that's why I was asking you what your background is. Okay, I hope that answers your question. It's a long version of what I do and <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Now, I think one of the things which is really interesting there that you mentioned is you recognize this divide, right? There are lots of startups, some with money, some without. They're looking for senior people, um, or maybe they don't know who they're looking for. So what, what kind of inspired you to create this model? Because I think this kind of fractional sense is maybe slightly new. So if you could kind of walk through what it is that you do and, and how you work with startups and, and how that might be relevant to somebody who's just breaking into UX. Sure, sure. Oh, just one additional point for the for Asia, we help a lot of these companies, Western tech companies in Asia. So we help Google, Airbnb, Dropbox, Intel, hardware, software, mobile, uh, yeah, internet companies, right? Um, and and just to give you some context, um, what I see in the market right now is this. <laughs> okay, I think ninety percent of the market are below ten years of experience. So 70% of the market is four years of experience. So you might be here, you know, if you just change industries, right? So you're one of the, like, like added together, right? One year below one year and one of four years is already 70% of the market. So the five to nine years are like the hot cakes right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm like the 1%, you know, right up on top here. Yeah, and so these are the hires, right? The 10% of the hires. Well, most of the other people are just getting in, try to learn the ropes, like what UX is about. I, am I suitable? Yeah, so that's the situation. Um, and the reason why I started a company here in Canada, uh, one, because I decided not to go back to Asia anymore. Uh, and secondly, is I also see a growing need in Canada. And I'm sure General Assembly knows that because you're trying to open up General Assembly Can like Vancouver and Calgary too, right? <laughs> yeah, um, is that uh, I see, especially in, in Western Canada here, um, a lot of the tech, large tech companies like Microsoft is hiring 500 people, Amazon is hiring 1000 people, and then Facebook is also trying to hire a lot of people. So I think because of these large tech companies are in Canada, um, also, it spurs a lot of the smaller tech companies as well, because there's a talent talent pool here, right? There are many universities here, BCIT, like SFU, uh, you know, UBC, right? Um, 
and in terms of your question about like how is it working with tech startups is um see tech startups like okay first first of all uh go back to the basics is when we say ux the term is really large okay some of the employees actually don't know what ux is <laughs> some of them think that you do ui like you do pretty icons like you put lipstick on a pig or you just paint a nice interface right so everybody has a different definition of ux because there's no legal definition so to speak like you don't you it's not like the legal lawyer lawyer industry that you need to get like a license to do ux so everybody has a different definition i would say so when you go interview for jobs just be careful like really understand what the other, the, the employer is, what their definition is, and if that matches what you want to do. Because when the job description says UX, it might not be what you think it is. Yeah, we've we've seen many terms like UX engineer, right, <laughs> or GUI, <laughs> like it's all over the place right now. Yeah. Just to ask you a question on that, out of interest, how do you, when you're speaking with startups, how do you define what they're looking for? How do you understand, I guess, what they're looking for? Okay, I, I would say I really encourage uh, younger designers to, if you work with tech startup, don't use the design language. Because they don't, they haven't gone to UX school, right? They actually don't speak our language. If you tell them user research and like customer journey, uh, blah, blah, persona, they're like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I actually use their language to talk to them. Um, in, their, in the startup world, their language for user research is actually customer discovery. Uh, for user testing, they actually use the word customer validation. Yeah, so I actually do the translation. <laughs> Yeah, because when you say user research, they'll be like, oh, we don't need research. We already either have it because they have a market research report or they'll be like, oh, we don't have time for research <laughs> because they think research is going to take two years, but it's not right. It, yeah. So so it's like uh, the terminologies are not lining up. Right. Yeah. So um, I would say there are many different levels of tech stops. There are tech stops who are somebody just graduated from school and decided to start a company okay that type don't join those uh join companies that ha are, have experienced founders maybe 10 15 years into their career have solid networking they are able to raise funds right they have expertise in the domain they're working in um yeah so not all startups are the same right um, and it's best if the startup either internally have a senior person to guide you, because if they don't, you will end up be slotted under marketing or slotted under tech, and you won't be doing what you really want to do in UX because their work processes are different. <laughs> Unless you're really good in soft skills and you can convince the CEO or CTO to do what you think should be done. Otherwise, I, I would guarantee you 100 like 99% of the time, they'll tell you, we don't have time for research. And then you won't be able to make design decisions because you can't even talk to users, right? Yeah. And just on that point, you, you know, from your conversations that you've had, and it's interesting you say it because you've heard from a few different people that research is one of the first thing that goes out of the window um, because maybe it doesn't offer value and they just want to build a product and get it out. And then maybe they'll iterate it on that point. What are some of the things that you say? Like research is important because of, you know, kind of X. Well, actually now uh, uh, we, we actually do help a lot of tech startups, especially those who are um, coming through, coming to Canada through the startup visa program uh, where, so, so the Canadian government is trying to accept 1.2 million people in the next two to three years, uh, you know, because Canada has more trees than people, right? So there's not enough population. <laughs> yeah. So um, they're trying to get more immigrants. Um, and, and, and nowadays, the government wants innovative entrepreneurs to come here, right? Not just mom and pop open a coffee shop type of businesses. Yeah, because I think the government wants businesses to be able to scale out of sight of Canada, go global, like Uber and Airbnb, right? Um, so for those type of tech startups, um, we are, we actually have a three month program with them 
So I tell them, this is what you need to do. If you need to like validate your business model and get through immigration, right? <laughs> because if your business is not innovative, then they don't want you, right? You need to prove that there's a market, which we do the market validation, which is user research basically. Um, and we, for each startup, we help them interview like 20 users across Canada, depending on what um, industry they're in. And based on those user research, that's how we come up with the design strategy and what their product should be. And even the business model, like how they should even charge, right? So I, I do business speak with business people. I don't do design speak. I only use design language with design people. <laughs> I'm on mute. Very cool. And so one of the things which I found interesting from what you said there was, you know, again, there's, there's going to be this influx of, you, you know, kind of international entrepreneurs coming to Canada and looking, you know, to hopefully set up a successful business. A lot of the people who we can see coming through General Assembly are Canadian nationals, people who are born, raised and educated here. I'd be interested to know your thoughts on how somebody who is Canadian can offer value in that sense to an organization which maybe doesn't have that Canadian lens. What they have is just maybe a very strong idea. Um, I think it works both ways. Um, for, for example, uh, Canada has 1.2 million SMEs, small, medium enterprises, maybe less than 10 people, I would say. That's most of Canadian businesses, as 90, like 90% 90 or more. Okay, um, I believe designers in such an environment, and this is same in Hong Kong, okay? There's only 2% big corporates. So designers, you either work in big corporates like the Microsoft, Amazons, or you work in small companies, right? Uh, I think it's good and bad. It's, it's not always good to work in big companies or you know, vice versa. Um, for smaller companies, you need to, you get to become more entrepreneurial yourself. And actually that's what I went through because like, remember I, I studied in the US, right? Work with bigger companies. I went back to Hong Kong. Like, so I went from Venus to Mars basically. So I was in for like the first 10 years in Hong Kong, nobody knew what the hell I was doing. Cause I was, I was back in a, it's like, I, I went, I went back to the future. Like I went back to a city where uh, like UX wasn't even a term like back in early 2000s, right? So I actually learned to speak the business language because everybody I meet, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm a UX and, or user experience. And they're like, huh? <laughs> what? what is that? Like, and I even try to look for jobs like that, right? And with the recruiters, they're like, well, you're not in marketing. You're not in engineering. Like, I don't know where to fit you, right? So, so. So the good news is if you work for a tech startup, number one, you learn to become an entrepreneur yourself, right? Because uh, that startup is probably led by a CEO who has raised funding before. They've uh, started multiple businesses, failed multiple times. Um, so that's good. Um, and you work very tightly with a team of like CEO, CTO, maybe CMO. So you get access to decision-making people. Uh, if they're small enough, like once they go bigger, then you'll be on the second or third level, right? Yeah. While the good news about working in larger companies like Amazon, Facebook, you know, Apple, those those types, is you can speak the design language because they know, they know exactly what you do when you say user research or use user journey, and but you're probably going to be less involved in business because those roles are usually product managers. Um, you know, who are responsible for uh, profit and loss, <laughs> right? Like they need to meet quotas or they need to make sure the product is successful in the market. Um, so I would say in larger companies, your role is much more specialized. So we have clients like uh, at Google where they are only user researchers. They don't do interaction design. They don't do visual design. They don't do, like they're not involved in the like real business aspect. They're just user researchers, okay? Or they're just visual designers. So these are really large companies that does that. In small companies, you have to be jack of all trades. <laughs> like the company might be, hey, although you're a UX designer, 
but we need a logo and we need a t-shirt and we need some business cards. Can you do it all? Because you are the designer, right, in the company. Yeah, so I think it's good and bad depending on your personality. You need to choose the right right way to go get it, right? Um, yeah, and I was going to ask if you have any recommendations for how somebody could learn the business speak. You know what I mean? Is there, is there a, 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 a kind of a, a platform or, or, or a group within which designers, new designers can also gain some of that familiarity with some of those key business terms? I would say uh, just hang out in communities that are not just design people. <laughs> yeah, I was, I in Hong Kong, I was in the design community. I was in the business communities and because like it was so different, right? Like I was in um, some, I was in the tech community as well. I, I, I went to startup weekend events. I went to hackathons. I went to uh, traditional business events like manufacturing, right? So like once you get out of your comfort zone and get mingled in all these different types of communities, you realize, oh my God, we're, we're all in little holes. Like if you go to the lawyer's, community like they're like speaking in another language <laughs> like barristers and solicitors and what and you're like what you know so the more you more exposure you get to other communities i think i think as a designer especially as an entrepreneur it's beneficial because now i can i can cross all all the gaps and speak in all different languages right <laughs> with these all different communities yeah for sure. I do want to come back to the startups, but, but out of interest on the communities point, because I think that your work within the interaction design community is really interesting. And we talk quite often about how, uh, you know, different people can get involved with relevant communities. So what do you look for when you're trying to tap into one? What do you look for? And, and what are the kind of things which you do to ensure that you can find success once you have found a community? Sure. So, OK, let me show you this. Um... So I like um, when I was still in school, like 20 years ago, <laughs> one thing I noticed and uh, thanks to my professor who, who he was really active in conferences and all that. So I kind of like followed on and every year I go to conferences, right? Uh, in, the, in the US when I was back in the US, 20, uh, you know, uh, 20 years ago. Um, so I was uh, pretty involved in the community. So when I went back to Hong Kong, I actually uh, started uh, IXDA with one of uh, my partners. And uh, so we run the community, right? So we get to see a lot of employers who are looking for UX designers or people want to get into the industry. So we hear, hear from both sides. Yeah, so we, we, we grew it to 2000 members. Um, so we have, so it's English and Cantonese uh, and Mandarin as well sometimes. Uh, so we, we launch events every single month. Uh, so this was Hong Kong. And then now in Canada, because I just came over last, last January. Yeah. Uh, and then I noticed, oh, there's another IX day in Vancouver, but it's dormant. <laughs> like there are 600 members here, but nobody's organizing any events, right? So we reach out to IX day global and say, hey, can we take over this? And they said, yes, so we did. Um, so we already organized a couple events and uh, last month, Oh, actually just earlier this month, we invited Facebook to talk about how to get hired in Silicon Valley companies, yeah, in UX. So uh, we're, we're getting more active. We're reaching out to employers as well. Because um, I, know, I know how hard it is for somebody to get into the industry, especially in these large companies. Because if, you, if your resume says you are a marketing person, like if 80% of what you have done before is like non-UX, these large companies, recruiters, they'll look at your profile, they'll be like, irrelevant. So it'll just go to trash, right? But through engaging in um, an industry professional community, for example, like I, we, I, so Loretta is actually my friend. <laughs> um, she works down in Silicon Valley because of COVID, she's in Vancouver. So I asked her to talk. And because of these events, of, like if you volunteer, you get access to these people, right? because you're organizing, you're reaching out, like you'll be helping reaching out to them. Uh, you understand more of what they are looking for. So Loretta is actually hiring right now and they don't, they don't actually also don't mind hiring remote. So right after the event that you can LinkedIn message these people and then they'll have an impression because you are active in the conversation, right? 
So I think that's a much better way to find a job than just sending tons of resumes. And I've heard many young people, they go to a boot camp, right? And then they send like 50 to 100 resumes and then no reply. Okay, that's very normal <laughs> because employers, they're busy. And if you look at the, the earlier chart, like only 10% of the market are senior people. I mean, these people are swamped, right? <laughs> they are so busy. In fact, like they're so busy, they probably don't even have time to come out to teach UX, right? Um, so, so they look at tons. And then in large corporates like Facebook, they have an internal uh, HR department and then which outsources to external recruiters and then they'll reach to you. However, these two entities in the middle, usually they don't know what's UX because in, in the industry, you need to be able to read a portfolio to be able to hire. But for people who don't really have a design background, they probably can't really decipher whether that person has a potential or not. Um, they're basically doing keyword matches, right? They're doing, okay, UX check, right? User research check, right? I mean, they, they don't know how to assess it. Um, yeah, in fact, we were, we're thinking of organizing more events to even educate the HR people or recruiters or, because I've heard from many junior designers, they're like, this job description is like looking for a unicorn. It's like four jobs in one. <laughs> like, they're asking me to do HTML, CSS, like front end programming research and you know marketing. <laughs> And, and this, this type of person actually does not exist, right? And uh, so after a while, the employers would be like, oh, I don't know why we're, we can't land anybody, right? Like after one or two years, then they will lower their expectations. Yeah, that's what we see happening right now. Um, yeah, and then in uh, um, actually Vancouver, we we're reaching out to some of the senior people. So uh, yeah, people from, uh, actually Peter Lass is in Toronto. He's at McKinsey, uh, Pascal's IBM, uh, some of the professors. We're reaching out to more people to see, uh, yeah, to, to get them as advisors of the association and uh, to close some of those gaps, right? And just to ask you a question on this, and I believe there is also um, a, a branch of this network in Toronto as well. Um, for somebody who is new to joining these kind of networks and these kind of communities, yeah. what would you say is a good way to introduce yourself to those people, you know, and try to start to build a bit of a brand for yourself within those communities? Yeah, I would say um, participate in our events, <laughs> be proactive, like be, uh, you know, in, involved, right? Uh, don't close your camera when you're in an event. Because seriously, because if the speaker recognizes your face, when you reach out to them, they'll give you a better opportunity than somebody who's just like blank, right? Like all the way through, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, also, I think sometimes junior designers don't realize how important soft skills and networking is. Most, most junior designers just focus on their portfolio and think that if you have a wow portfolio, then people will hire you. I'm not saying portfolio is not important, but I'm saying your character, your soft skills, your passion is just as important or not even more important. I've actually given opportunities to people who maybe uh, don't really have a design background, but you know they're super enthusiastic, they're, they have a good character because I've observed them when they volunteered. <laughs> you can actually see some true colors when people volunteer. You know, when people drop the ball, you know, I can't hire this person. Yeah, and, pe and it's a small community, people talk, right? Like, and if there's op opportunities from different volunteers, they'll say, hey, why don't you join our company, right? Uh, but if they know, hey, you weren't really responsible, <laughs> like, in a volunteer setting, you drop the ball, um, didn't show up, right? You're not gonna be referred. Yeah, so I think people don't realize how important uh, these things are to building your personal brand and credibility, even in a volunteering situation, right? Uh, and even in Hong Kong, we have had 
volunteers who got hired because they volunteered. And then some other volunteers are like, hey, my company's actually hiring you, you wanna join us? It's that simple, right? Like zero resume and portfolio basically because you built your personal brand. Yeah. Yeah, that's such great advice. You know, I think that it really does go to show how far people can go just based on themselves, you know, on, on who they are as the individual without getting too hung up on, you know, the portfolio, particularly for everybody coming through the bootcamp grad. You know, it is a big point of conversation, right? Is getting that portfolio. How do you need to make it look? Is, is that everything that you have? But no, you're so much more than that, to your point. And there are so many opportunities for you to be able to show that. I think people hire you, number one, because they like you first. Of course, your skills need to be solid, right? But even Rebecca, uh, sorry, Loretta, Loretta, Facebook design manager, she, she said, that when she first started, she also volunteered for IXDA. And this is in the US, you know, and that was before COVID when, you know, it was live events, like she helped set up tables. And then she was sitting right across the, the hire who hired her, right? Wow. And she didn't get to Facebook on the first day. She worked on like maybe one or two like smaller name companies, startups, and then moved on to larger agencies. And then maybe by the fifth job, she went to Netflix. By the sixth job, she went to Google. And by the 15th year, <laughs> she went to Facebook, right? So also, I think some people have to adjust their expectations of it because I've seen many that are like, oh, after the three months boot camp, I can get a six-figure job. Uh, yeah. You can't be Jamie Oliver's after going to three months like cooking you know, cooking training, right? You can't, well, some people could be very good, but you know, any mastery takes time, right? Maybe 10,000 hours of training. So I would suggest just, just find good employers and just work the hell out of your portfolio. Like just crunch out many, many, many portfolios and get a, as, as much experience as you can. Like real world experience, not fictitious one. Yeah. Definitely. I think it's so fun. So one of the things I want to make sure is if, you, if anybody does have a question you'd like to take this off of mute to ask, please do so. I think there's been so many great pieces of advice here um, that if anybody wants to yeah, ask a question, please do so. Oh, I can also show you what we're doing with the tech startups. I think that was the earlier question. Please, yeah. So right now we have a, uh, what I call a CXO advisory, which is Chief Experience Officer. Because, um, well, let me show you this first. Okay, usually in a tech startup, and we're looking for funded start. We're not looking for fresh grad startups, right? We're looking for people who have already have, uh, the CEO probably are in their 40s, have like 10, 15 years in, in a particular industry, have the network, have the domain expertise, have the funding, initial funding, right? It doesn't have to be super big funding. Otherwise, they'll have, already a internal UX lead, right? Um, so they usually have a CEO and a CTO, right? Most of the tech stars that I know, they don't have a CXO. They don't have a equal level senior design person to guide them, right? Um, so what, what ends, up, ends up happening is they will hire a junior person fresh out from school, and then that designer quits in three months because the design will be like, I'm doing graphic design or I'm doing social media, right? I'm not doing UX, right? Um, so I, yeah, so basically I will train up interns on the job and put them uh, working together with the tech startup involving their CEO and CTOs. Yeah, and what we do is uh, we help them and, and look at this. I don't use the design language when, when, I, when I talk to them. So is get product market fit, validate customer needs, create minimal viable products, advice on the UX strategy, help them build the UX team. And I will also bring in other, other expertise like hardware people or engineers. Yeah, if they, if they need. Yeah. And I work with, uh, I have a CTO partner as well, uh, chief technology officer, and he's also an angel investor. So um, yeah, and we've been, I've been training startups, uh, a lot in Asia, like for the past 18 years and many of the different accelerators, incubators. Yeah, so I, 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 I do know how to speak their language. 
<laughs> a bit more, right? And and know how how they usually think, because um, usually tech startups they, oops, yeah, what they do is. <laughs> The CEO is usually a business person, and then they have an idea in the head, right? And uh, in order to get to funding, they need a CTO, like to do to execute what they have in their heads, right? But usually, it's very hard to execute that idea before they validate the idea, which is the user research part, right? Yeah, and then because tech per, tech people are very good in tech, but they're, they're not very good in people <laughs> understanding market needs. So what ends up happening is usually they'll build the product for a year, like coding it, right? Uh, it's even worse in hardware. And then after a year or so, when money runs out, they find out that nobody wants to buy it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that, that's where we say, hey, you, you know, you don't need to do this. You can actually hire people like us who are more like the architects, right? Um, where we build the vision uh, and we call, we built the smokes and mirrors. <laughs> it's like before you buy a real uh, apartment, you actually look at the demo demo home, right? Yeah, we, we built, built the, uh, it's like Wizard of Oz. <laughs> where, where we show them what could happen, right? But it's not coded at the end, yeah. But we show them the business value first. And, and then they actually, with that prototype, they can actually onboard the CTO, onboard the investors, yeah. And so we've got a question here from one of our designers, sure. Scott. Um, and so Scott did go into a, a smaller startup um, and we will sign a lot of our, a lot of, in fact, all of our graduates w may look at that or, or go ahead and do that. And so for somebody that is in that kind of situation, what recommendations would you have for a designer in a smaller startup, um, which maybe hasn't yet got that really large round of funding, maybe they're aspiring to that? Okay, so, uh, so when you say what recommendation, what aspect of recommendation are you looking for? Like, are you, ta are you talking about how do you communicate with them? Or are you talking about what, like if they don't have enough funding or what? Ask um, yeah, so sorry, I'm, I'm Scott, good day. I'm, I'm working with the startup. There's about four of us, uh, great CEO, really experienced in the industry. Um, yeah. More about the actual design side, because we are pre-launch, how would you recommend going about user research and you know, some of those key design steps that without uh -huh. having a, a more experienced designer to follow, what, what kind of tips would you? So recommend? are you the, the only person, the only designer in the company? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite common. Yes. It's good fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, every, you just need to know that everything the CEO thinks about is how do I make money, right? How do I stay afloat? Because yeah. you have to pay your bills, right? Yes, to pay how many how many people are in your company? Well, up until next week, it's just him and I. So, <laughs> and oh, then, okay. yeah, just, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. So that's pretty early stage. So, which stage of startup are you in? Is it? We are yeah. hoping to wrap up our first round of seed funding in the next month or so. Okay. Um, get an MVP out in the, the next two months is the goal. I see, I see. Well, sometimes you don't, you just need to know that uh, people are not in that industry, they just care about results, mm -hmm. okay? So you don't have to tell them so much about the process even, because the more unfamiliar terms you throw at them, the more like, ah, we don't need this, right? Just just pick the interface, right? Yeah. That, that's, how, that's how they respond, right? So because it's just two of you, you don't have a lot of people to convince, right? just go do your user research yourself or get interns to help or I don't know, friends to help. Just interview, like who's your target audience? Like who's your, who's the customer? Um, well, we're, we're a B to B to C model, which also makes things interesting. Um, we are a financial wellness benefit platform, which so it's, a, it's a really cool platform that I'm super excited about to be working on. And the CEO is great. And I can yeah. talk about it. For the whole rest of the hour but we don't have time so um but yeah our, our users ideally are people who want to improve their financial wellness which is a pretty broad 
scope of of people, but full time employees that are looking to improve their financial situation. I see. I see. Well, I can maybe just show you quickly. Uh, like we we talk to real people. <laughs> you know, like these are these are real people, right? And mm -hmm. uh, I have them go through a process. All, all the startups we work with, like we go through a methodological process, right? And and I know like as designers, usually um, <laughs> we are, we don't think very rigidly. We're very fluid in our, in our heads, but actually non-designers don't work this way. If you work with business people or tech people, they need to be line item, one, two, three, four, five, break. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, break. You know, like they, that's the way they process information, right? So you need to speak their language. So I actually came up with that curriculum and say, okay, this is month one. This is what we're going to achieve. Month two. So basically month one is user research, right? Yeah. One user research. Number, month two is like, we'll come up with the design. And month three, we're going to validate it. That's simple, right? Like just simple for them to understand. And then um, like in terms of recruiting people, like you do it, right? <laughs> you you go find the right users um, and actually get get him get him involved um, to listen in to people and maybe like the hardest thing is to is to first get him to agree on uh, being user centered is a good thing like or don't use the word user even we need to be customer centered like no company would say I don't want to be customer centered right no he's all he's already all the way pulled in my my CEO is great. He's That's like, right. we're very aligned with what we're trying to do, which is, which yeah. is awesome. Yeah. Oh, maybe you should um, also sign up for this service, which is awesome. It's called Respondent.io. Um, of course, sometimes you have to pay a bit of fees. Um, depending on your target audience, if you're just looking for, well, if you're looking for financial people, then they probably need to be people who invest. Is that right? No, no, we're actually, we're targeting the other end. So people are really struggling financially. We're trying to build them up. Oh, yeah. struggling financially. Yeah, so it's, it's really fun. <laughs> users like, well, Simple or Robinhood type of anything? Uh, lower on the financial literacy scale than that. So we're, we're trying to help people get out of credit card debt, um, you know, figure out budgeting, that kind of stuff. Well, maybe go to schools, right? Universities, students? Well, our, our users, uh, because we're an employee wellness, our users all have full-time jobs. That's, that's kind of the one criteria. So our customers are employers, our users are employees. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, yeah. if you're in this part of situation, everything is a hypothesis. That's, until, yeah, that's where we're at. Until you, prove, until you validate it. Because everything is an assumption, right? Yeah. yeah. And we, we, we are lucky that there have been c customers with similar business models overseas that have worked quite well. So a lot of what I'm doing is seeing what they've done well and what they've done poorly and, you know, copying their homework. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I would, I mean, for B2B, sometimes it's harder to recruit. Uh, I personally, what I do is I actually join business networks to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I join like business associations so I can reach out to, uh, these networks otherwise like if people don't know you they'll be like especially if you don't even pay them right uh, we usually do pay respondents fees um, yeah. then people will be motivated to talk to you or go on linkedin and search for the right target and and just actually i think user research is a really really good uh, way to train up even sales skills yeah, because you need to convince yeah. people to participate, right? Yeah. Sometimes there's no budget, right? You need to be able to say say things that is positioned to their benefit. I'm not saying I'm not saying that you you're lying. You just need to align their interests with yours. Yeah. To, to want to even participate in an hour's interview, right? Yeah. So it's actually really good training on your sales skills. Yeah. Yeah. I um I come from a bit of a sales and financial advice background as well, so I've, I can some of those things. Yeah. Or yeah. Just tell your CEO partner that hey, uh, why don't we just talk to customers, um, like customers, although in your yeah. head users, right? <laughs> and and oh, just find out about their pain points. 
like why would he say no right <laughs> yeah yeah no that's that's a very good point thank you very much for that insight yeah yeah and plus actually while you're doing user research you're already onboarding the potential customer Has, because our customers are different than our users it's it oh. makes it tougher to to make that that one-to-one -one. um yeah it's, it's it's fun it's a fun challenge <laughs> yeah yeah uh, because i mean from the user or the customer perspective they're like oh wow you're interviewing me but you're not selling me right you're just trying to ask my opinion and i'm involved in the product development that's that's cool right yeah yeah like yeah, my, my only other question is, uh, is your CTO partner and angel investor looking for a new startup to invest in? <laughs> yeah, maybe you can, you can send me your website. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. I'd, I'd, I'd be remiss not to try and take the shot when I might get it. So thank, thank you very much, Elaine. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I can also show you some of the tech stuff we've been working with. Um, and, and it's interesting because a lot of them, like before we went through the process, they actually have a very different business model. Like for example, uh, this one, let me see what I have it here. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so this this one, um, so so the, the founder is from Hong Kong also. Uh, so he's coming over here for, for the Star Visa program. So when he originally came to us, he had one slide of his business model. It's basically to, install vending machines in different areas in Canada. So it will allow people to recycle their plastic bottles and the plastic bottles will be upcycled into something else, right? And then of course, being people in Canada, you know that Canada does, does recycling pretty well, right? With recycle bins BC every day, you put, you, you sort all your plastics and and paper, and then the city brings it away, right? Because he had in his mind, Hong Kong model. <laughs> yeah, in Hong Kong, everybody walks and everybody takes the subway. Even in Vancouver, it's like everybody drives, right? So it's a completely different context. Um, so when we validated his business model in, in Canada, actually we interviewed people all over Canada, like Montreal, Toronto, Ontario, like, so this is all online. Uh, we found out that, uh oh, his, his business model doesn't work. Yeah. Um, instead, we actually threw the interviews um, and, and also actually user research uh, before COVID, all our research are almost in person and we go to their workplace or their homes. Okay. But now because of COVID, nobody wants to see anyone. So, so we just had to do remote research instead. Um, but we found another model for him, uh, which is um, to connect. So, so these these are upcycle. So this is this is made out of chopsticks. This decor, this is made out of a skateboard. This is made out of recycled lamps. This chandelier. Okay. So so we create a new business model for him where um, anybody can download an app to clean out your basement basically because you get points if you do. <laughs> And then you can donate them. And then we'll have people in the middle who uh, like Uber drivers in their downtime would, would, would actually help deliver the materials to uh, a creator like who's, who could be a designer, architect, artist to upgrade, you know, upgrade the material into a sellable, expensive product, right? So uh, yeah. So, so actually, I think user research is integral to innovation insights. Yeah, uh, and and I actually, when I speak to SME owners, I say we're we're doing customer discovery for business model innovation insights. <laughs> That's how I say it. I don't say, oh, we have to do user research. We have to do user research. They'll be like, why do we need to do user research? We're not. We're not R and D universities. We don't need to do research <laughs> because they get hung up on the word research, right? Yeah. And then we just also did another startup that's a uh, crypto mining for the home. <laughs> so you can buy one of these, plug it in, it'll help you make money. <laughs> yeah. And then you can see it on your 
on your app. Yeah. Um, this one is a uh, edutainment to teach kids uh, Chinese, especially those who grew up in uh, North America who are losing their mother tongue, right? So, so we have uh, some founders here. And then the other one is uh, helping Western R&D companies access the Asia market remotely, right? To, to uh, find uh, end users for testing their concepts. Yeah. So we have other founders here. Yep. So that's, that's what we do. Any, any more questions? So there is one that I want to make sure that I get to hear from Janice. It's it's uh, more in line with the conversation around volunteering, less on this, although I really like the crypto mining one. If there's a way that I can get rich by watching TV, can I sign me up? But uh, <laughs> just going back to the volunteering. So how would you suggest being able to volunteer when things are online? Oh, it's, it's I mean, we're our industry is so lucky. You know, we, we're still in business because everything is online. We, like, my, my laptop is my office, okay? So if you're in UX, you're lucky, man. Like, if you're in other industries like retail, restaurants, like, hardware, you're dead. I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so sad, like, for some of the offline businesses, right? So consider yourself lucky if you can work online. Um, so I would suggest two things. Um, you can either volunteer for IXDA, which is the association, that we run, oops. Or if you're interested in um, volunteering for our, our tech startup internship, uh, I, I'm not sure if I should call it internship if it's a volunteer, right? Um, yeah, scan this QR code. It will take you to this site here, which is like, we just have a Google form and you can fill out your information. Uh, so we have a better sense of who you are, what your background is, and then we can get back to you. Uh, yeah, if you want to scan this. Or I can just type, maybe type this into the chat. Yeah, so this is, uh, oh, okay, thank you. Yep. Um, or uh, if you're interested in volunteer for our association, that's also possible. Um, where because we're organizing monthly events uh yeah the next person that we'll have in june will be somebody who worked at asana and dapper labs uh yeah so and so we're looking for speakers constantly as well to share you know what what they know in the community yeah and uh yeah so those are two 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 things like either the association which is not profit uh, which is, uh, you know, this is more getting connected into the industry. The other one is uh, if you are interested in creating a portfolio, right? Like, uh, like a real project for three months, for example. Um, yeah, but but that will we'll have to see what your background is if it matches with the projects that we need, and if you have the language skills or the cultural background that's relevant. Yeah. So upcoming, we have some medical projects as well. Yeah, so that's that. Very cool. One other, oh, one other quick question, sorry, that came in. I'm just wanting to be cognizant of time. And so this speaks to um, the graph you showed regarding the job market. And so what does the job market graph you showed earlier means for entry-level designers? Do you think there's a lot of opportunity? Uh, do you think it's extremely competitive? Or what does that, what does that information tell you? Okay, this graph here. Okay, well, I can tell you, I think there are lots of opportunities, especially in Vancouver. I don't know about Toronto, but the reason why I stayed here, you know, after I came over last year is because I saw this, right? Um, so I think maybe thanks to Trump, <laughs> because US had tightened their H-1B visas so I think it pushed a lot of the tech companies to come up to Canada. Oops. Um, I think, wait, let me see. Uh, yeah, it pushed a lot of the tech um, companies to come up, come to Canada because, um, one second. So, so like I said, uh, One second. Like, yeah, like I said, um, yeah, the face, 
the Facebooks, Apple, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, they're all hiring you. If, if you go to LinkedIn and you type Vancouver, let's say, I don't know about Toronto, you go UX jobs, Vancouver, right? T tons of jobs right now. Yeah, Microsoft, Salesforce, Amazon, you know, uh, some like Hootsuite, right? User testing, Lululemon, EY, right? Tons of jobs. However, the, the, here's where the gap is. The gap is some of these companies, they're hiring senior people, right? More senior people. So I think junior people is actually good for you to sharpen your saw with textiles first as a first step. Um, and then move on to larger companies. Yeah. But sometimes, maybe after you work with smaller companies, you're like, I actually don't want to work with large companies. That's fine too, right? I, I think larger companies, your role is more specific. Smaller companies, you get to do the whole gamut. And depending on your long-term goals, if you want to be an entrepreneur, I think working with textile is actually a good thing. Yeah. If you want a stable job, go to a larger company. There's, there's no right or wrong. It depends on your personality. Some people, like, I would die if I go to a large company. I, I don't like bureaucracy and, and taking, like, we have clients uh, where <laughs> their team only works on the keyboard. Like, the whole team is about the keyboard, right? Like, I would die if I do that. Like, I like variety. And for people, um, especially people who are early into the industry, I, I would suggest even going to agencies. Because agencies, you get to work on a lot of different products, right? Like, and that's, and I think it's good for networking. It's good, like, like we've worked on everything, right? Baby products, furniture, hardware, software, internet, mobile, like everything. Uh, service companies. Um, so I think your 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 viewpoint of the world is much wider than if you go to a, if you go to a huge corporate. You might, I, I know people who've worked at Motorola for 30 years and all they focus on is walkie talkies, <laughs> you know? So that that's something you, you need to decide for yourself, like what type of personality you are. Yeah. Um, so I would say there are a lot of opportunities overall, but they might be sitting here, the five to nine years of experience. And one of the reason I think is because of globalization. Uh, so actually, this is a deck from another talk um, where, let's see. Let me show you. Do you guys know these sites? Like if larger companies need to hire non-integral roles, they can go on these websites, top total. They will go to Upwork. They can find freelance UX designers in Africa, right? Or Eastern Europe. Um, and because the world is flat now, I, I was actually really surprised too, because a, a, a month ago, um, I'm also a mentor on ADP list. Oh, you should go on ADP list as well. Do you guys know that? ADP list is like a free mentorship for UX people, free, right? Um, and then, so I mentored, one, one person signed up on ADP list and he was from South Africa. And I was pretty surprised because um, I think what he knows and what he's doing, it, it could be very similar to somebody from Hong Kong or from Canada. Like he's doing AR stuff because the world is flat. Information is flat, right? So even though he come, came from another part of the world, uh, his knowledge base might be quite similar, right? And then he already talked to 49 people, <laughs> uh, mentors on ADP list. He's just, just so much more hardworking, right? Yeah. Um, so I would say mentorship is definitely super important if you want to get into the industry easily. Like if you find a senior person who's willing to teach you, um, that's the easiest way, I would say. And so just um, shooting in the dark, trying things out, doing online courses, 
watching YouTube videos nonstop <laughs> because you can't learn you can't learn to ride a bike by reading a book. It's sort of like that, right? Like you have to do real projects. You can't just absorb information because there's a lot of uh, in UX. It's a team sport. You need to work with other disciplines. You need that interaction. Um, so I would say just do as many internships as you can or volunteer uh, internships even. If that's how people will give you a chance uh, if you show enough enthusiasm. Yeah, but don't drop the ball because people are gonna remember. <laughs> and right. it comes back later on in life, <laughs> I tell you. Okay. That's concerning. I've dropped the ball many times. So <laughs> it's not going to come back to bite me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one thing I'm aware is we're already over time. And so I do want to be respectful um, of your time, Elaine, and of course, uh, our guest we have today. The time absolutely flew by, though. So I think it was really interesting to kind of hear your thoughts and your experiences. Y you know, and from what it sounds like, you know, again, it really is a matter of for junior designers, you know, volunteering, you know, establishing a network demonstrating the strength of soft skills and once they land the problem it's about talking in that you know less design speak and, and actually finding the middle ground with the people around them yeah i would say uh you can go onto my channel <laughs> i have a ux uh youtube channel just type elaine and you find it uh especially watch this guy nico from hsbc bank uh i met him three years ago he was like he was already a seasoned marketing advertising guy for 10, 15 years. And he was like, how do I get into industry? I don't know how, right? So basically he talked to like 50 people, senior designers in the industry. And then he, he got a good sense of, basically he did his own user research on how to get into the industry, right? So if you watch this video, he's gonna tell you, uh, he doesn't have a resume and a portfolio and he created his role as lead of customer experience in at XBC Bank in Hong Kong. It was, it was an amazing story, right? So um, I was, yeah, and I just want, want to show you one last slide. And that's people underestimate the type of soft skills that are needed um, to, to, to get into the industry. We, we interviewed we did a workshop with the senior designers in Hong Kong and we asked them, so what do you think is missing in the market right now? And they're, and these are what they, they showed us. This is sticky notes on the wall. None of these skills are mentioned in job descriptions. It's, research, it's thinking skills, facilitation, analytical language skills, social skills, improvisation skills, business skills, lateral thinking, critical thinking, problem solving, right? Most of the job descriptions just, just say, oh, we, user research, uh, user journey, persona. They don't mention this, but if you're changing industry, you might already have these soft skills. So you just need to demonstrate enthusiasm and get to know the hard skills and terminologies, right? And, and just get as much experience as you can working on real projects is what I recommend, okay? Excellent advice. Yeah, so just my email, uh, yeah, and contact if you need. <laughs> well, Elaine, thank you so much. It has been uh, really insightful. You know, again, clearly you, you have seen what has worked, you know, what hasn't, how people can help themselves to stand out within this competitive and noisy market. But I think one of the things which is really kind of, you know, inspiring or optimistic from what I've heard is there's opportunity, right? And to your point, companies are flocking to Canada. The positions are there and, uh, you know, really appreciate to be able to hear yeah. that from you. So thank you so much. Yeah, I would say if you go over the hump in the first one or two years, <laughs> which some of my students have, the first two years is a little struggling. But I have had students who, they, they, they start off as a junior designer in uh, DBS Bank. Uh, it's a Singaporean bank in Hong Kong. By the third year, he was originally commissioned to hire his own UX manager. He couldn't, they couldn't find anybody. So he became the UX manager in one year, right? Yeah. And in China, the UX directors are under 30s because there's nobody. So you, you can move very fast. So.
Yeah. For sure. And with those moves, of course, salary follows as well. Yeah. <laughs> so. if, you, if you learn the business speak, though, well, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's okay. key. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elaine. Um, if you're wanting this recording, of course, we do have it equally for yeah. all of our guests as well. Um, I will have I will update the recordings tracker with this. So, of course, anybody can go ahead and watch that back. Uh, and Elaine, hopefully we'll talk again soon. OK, thanks, George. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thank good you. Evening. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Matt, just you and I, how have you been getting on? Good. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop that. <laughs>